All right, welcome back. Dr. P here, and uh, we're going to start talking about Chapter 8. And in this lecture, I'm going to look at the halogenation of alkenes as well as halohydrin formation. Now, I should note that the halogenation of alkenes is section 8.2, and halohydrin formation is section 8.3. So uh, for right now, uh, don't worry about section 8.1. You can read about it. It's really just a preview of a later chapter. Um, section 8.1 deals with uh, preparing alkanes via elimination reactions. And we'll talk about elimination reactions uh, later on, I think chapter 11. So let's take a look at the halogenation of alkenes. So in particular, we have the following reaction. So let's just do a cyclohexene here and Br2. And usually we'll use methylene chloride or something as the solvent. I'm not going to write that in here right now. Well, maybe I will. CH2Cl2. And this reaction happens rapidly. And what we end up getting is interesting because we get a pair, in this case, a pair of enantiomers. Whoops, sorry about that. Sorry, not a pair of enantiomers, but we get a pair of products that are enantiomers. Br and Br. And this is rapid. Okay, so what I want to do is take some time or spend some time thinking about what kind of mechanism could account for the formation of these products. So um, I'm just right here, mixture of products. And we say that we have an anti-addition because the bromines are adding to uh, different sides of the double bond or different faces of the double bond. So again, our double bond is here in the plane of the paper. And one bromine's coming in from this side and the other bromine's coming in from the other side. But the question is how to get that to happen with Br2. So I'm gonna propose a mechanism here, or rather I'm going to draw a mechanism, uh, which is the mechanism that uh, is generally accepted because it meets all of the, uh, or it explains the product formation. All right, so I have my cyclohexene here. And I like to use cyclohexene um, to, to show this because uh, that way you can really see how we get the uh, anti-additions. And there's two possible ways to do the anti-addition. That's why we get the two uh, isomers. That's why we get the enantiomers. Now we have extra electron density in this double bond. So those electrons can come and make a bond to the bromine. Now, this will actually, I hope we'll end up breaking that bromine-bromine bond, but bromine itself has plenty of electron density. So it will then, at the same time, react with the other carbon. And so what we get is the following.
we get something called a bromonium ion. And that's the type of intermediate that we get. And this has a three-membered ring. And in this case, you know, if we're, we're saying that our, our six-membered ring here is, is in the plane of the paper, I mean, it's, you know, it's a cyclohexane, so it's really not, but uh, this ring is kind of pointing, pointing up, and the bromine is part of it. Now, of course, three-membered rings are going to be um, rather unstable. Uh, they're highly strained. So the next step of the mechanism will have the other bromine from the Br2 come along. That's now Br- minus because we had a pair of electrons go there. And then this guy can add in there. And that gives us what? Well, if the bromine adds in there, then that's going to have to kick those electrons up onto that bromine and we will be left with Br. And this bromine had to come in from the other side of this wedge bond here, so that means that it is dashed Br, like so. Or We'll say or. My bromine could attack the other carbon and then we'll go ahead and get those electrons moving. And that now gives me my other product here. So those electrons move, that bond breaks, that pops open. So this bromine is now the wedge pointing out towards us. And the dashes are the other bromine there. Okay, so there's two possible outcomes here, depending on which, um, which uh, uh, bromine gets um, attacked by the the bromide ion. Sorry, not which bromine, which carbon gets attacked by the bromide ion. So this is a little bit different mechanism than what we've seen. We've got this rather interesting bromonium ion uh, as the intermediate. We don't get a carbocation. Now, if we got a carbocation, the only problem is that then we'd have a planar carbocation and the bromine could then add to either side. So we wouldn't specifically get this mixture of enantiomers. We'd also get some where both bromines were wedges, um, as you know, well as this, this combination as well. So this mechanism is the one that explains best um, the products that we get. Okay. Now, let me just see if there were any other features I wanted to mention. Um, da -da -da -da. I don't think so, not right now, except for the following. What if we didn't have methylene chloride? What if we had some water present instead? Because methylene chloride just sits there, it doesn't do anything. But what if we had something else. What if we had water present? So let's have Br2, but let's have H2O present. What do we end up getting? Well, We actually end up getting uh, da, 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 da. that's right. We 
actually end up getting compound, a compound called a halohydrin. Okay, so we're adding a halogen, we're also adding the OH, and that came from the H2O. Now, how does this happen? Well, the first step in the mechanism is the same. Uh, the same as the halogenation, I should say. So I'll have that attack there. Those guys will go there, and that'll break there. sloppy bond there. Oops, three, four, positive charge. Now I could have my water come along. And water can be a nucleophile. It's not a strong nucleophile, but this is very reactive. Okay, so H2O is a uh, weak nucleophile, but ammonium ion is reactive. So now my H2O can come along and add there. And that, of course, is going to break this bond and kick electrons up back onto the bromine and give us, now our bromine is up like this. And then down this way on the dash, I have OH2 with the lone pair and a positive charge. And now another molecule of water can come along. We wouldn't use the Br minus. We're gonna use water because it's the solvent. We have plenty of that. We wouldn't use Br minus because it's not as, actually as good a base as water is in this case. And we'll get proton transfer. And that will give us now What's a B there for bromine? O, H, lone pair, lone pair. And there is one of our two products. Now, the other one is formed if our H2O attacks the other side and then um, We'll go ahead and I won't draw those uh, steps out, but uh, it's the same sort of thing. We get the, the OH2 added here and it's a dash. Bromine pops open, it's a wedge on this carbon. And then we get the deprotonation and we get this guy here. Okay, so I want to call your attention to the bromonium ion and what's going on with the bromonium ion. And let's see if I can get all of this up here together. There we go. So we make the bromonium ion intermediate and then a nucleophile of some sort will go ahead and attack one of those carbons and pop open, uh, pop open the, uh, pop open the, the ring. Now, if we had a different nucleophile present, like water, we can still get the ring popping open. It's just we end up getting a different product. Now, I'm calling some attention to this because um, we will see this in a few other cases where a three-membered ring is formed, either as an intermediate or as a um, or as an actual initial product in the case of epoxides. Um, but these three-membered rings are reactive, and so uh, 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 something that is a good enough nucleophile 
can attack and pop open the uh, pop open the the ring. All right. So I wanted to show you that mechanism, or I should say those mechanisms um, for both halogenation and halo hydrogen formation. And then in subsequent videos, we'll go ahead and take a look at some more reactions. We'll look at hydration next, and uh, we'll look at some more reactions uh, throughout the rest of the, um, the rest of this chapter. All right. Until next time, stay safe out there. Bye now.